Thanks, everyone. Well, our next presenter <clears throat> is Dr. Tyler Dare, who uh, is waving at you right now. Um, Tyler is from the Applied Research Laboratory at Penn State, and he's going to talk about how you choose the right sound level meter. Hello, I'm Tyler Dare. This video is part of a series of presentations on sound level meters. And what I'm talking about is how you could go about choosing a sound level meter, some things to think about when you go to purchase a sound level meter. The first thing you're going to need to decide is if you look at this IEC standard 61672-1, it defines two different classes of sound level meters. And essentially class one, they, they meet a lot of the same criteria, but class one is just more accurate. So class one is going to be accurate to within plus or minus one dB at most frequencies, whereas class two, um, a little bit wider error bands, one and a half dB at most frequencies. Uh, the other big differences is that class one has to have um, C weighting and along with the A weighting that both classes will have <clears throat> and a little bit of a wider frequency range on class one. And of course, you're gonna, you're gonna pay for those differences, the class one will tend to cost a bit more. Um, I want to point out that there are things that you could buy online that uh, claim to be sound level meters or noise meters, but if they don't list this IEC standard in their specifications and stamped on the meter itself, um, then it's not guaranteed to be uh, accurate according to either of these two classes, and it's probably worth avoiding. Um, so once you've decided what class of meter you want, uh, the other thing is um, that's defined in the IEC standard is kinds of sound level meters. And the standard defines three different meters, but two of them are uh, kind of functionally equivalent in my mind. There's a what's called a time weighting meter or sometimes called a conventional meter. That's something that can output the F or fast time weighting, but can't necessarily output something like an equivalent sound pressure level averaged over the whole measurement length. Something that can do the equivalent sound level or um, a sound exposure, exposure level is called an integrating or integrating averaging sound level meter. And there's different kinds of sounds that you can uh, accurately describe with these different metrics. So, a really easy one is if you have something like this, this dehumidifier, it's going to output a steady continuous sound. And all of these metrics are going to be pretty much the same. Uh, so a fast time averaging or a slow time averaging or an equivalent level over the, the measurement time, it's gonna give you pretty much the same answer. You can measure it with lots of different kinds of meters. Um, a little bit more difficult sound to measure would be a fluctuating sound. So something like where uh, where my technician um, is vacuuming up different kinds of debris, the noise output from the vacuum is going to vary as a function of time. Uh, even more extreme would be something like a chainsaw where the sound level varies with load, but it also has periods of being totally turned off. Those kinds of things you can measure with a conventional sound level meter that will only output the time weighted level, but you have to be very careful and it, you often have to break the sound into segments that can be considered steady. This is according to ANSI S1.13. Um, wherever possible, I would recommend uh, getting a meter that will do both of these things. So something that will do an LEQ measurement, but also a fast time weighting measurement. So let's talk about some additional features you're going to see advertised. Maybe um, I want to point out when these things might be useful and when you probably don't need to spend the money on them. All of these things are going to cost extra money. One thing that tends to drive the cost a lot of sound level meters is whether or not they can measure octave band or one third octave bands and output those levels. So a lot of times there's some standards like the NC curves uh, that you have to report results in octave bands. So you essentially you need something that's going to, to output those levels. Um, but 
it's also very useful to have one third octave bands for diagnosing the source of a noise. So if you look at this, uh, this plot here, maybe we have a broadband noise with a, a very tonal thing um, superimposed on it. And that's what that, that bar that's higher at 500 hertz would indicate. So if we have that output, we might be able to say, uh, oh, the, the overall level is being driven by something that's a, a tonal content at 500 hertz. It helps you in diagnosing the source of the noise. You might also see narrowband spectra, or they sometimes label it as FFT spectra. So instead of one third octave bands, it would be at something like one hertz uh, bin widths. That can be useful too, especially for looking at things that are very, very tonal, just kind of pure tone sources. Uh, other thing might, that might be useful, most of the time for most applications, and, and especially in industrial noise, the, the, the frequency range of these meters is gonna be just fine for your purposes. But if you're in an industry or you're looking to get into an industry like wind noise, um, where people are concerned about infrasound, so things below the human range of, of hearing, having a microphone that is calibrated out that low can be very useful. Or if uh, you're going to a factory where people are complaining about very, very high frequency sounds, uh, those can typically be generated by um, motor pulse width modulation signals. Having something that can go even higher than that frequency range can be useful as well. Something that I would absolutely recommend if you can afford it is the ability to record time histories of the sounds you're measuring with your sound level meter. So you can just record time traces as say a WAV file. And those are useful for kind of marketing purposes. You can play back the noise to your clients, but it can also be extremely useful for you to do some advanced signal analysis back in the lab you can uh, do something like a spectrogram and see how the frequency content changes with time. You can reproduce all of these uh, metrics we're gonna be talking about here. Um, and usually this, um, the ability to record time histories goes hand in hand with uh, Z-weighting, a Z-weighting option, uh, being able to record an unweighted signal. Very useful. Um, kind of going along with that is a lot of meters have the ability to do multiple measurements at the same time or, or process the sound in multiple ways at the same time. Um, this is useful because we almost always want to measure the equivalent A-weighted sound pressure level. Um, that's just helpful to, for something to compare to, make sure you're, you're meeting some noise regulations. <clears throat> but you might also want to do some some diagnostic things, maybe measure a C-weighted peak level at the same time. So being able to measure those, those two things at the same time can be very useful. Um, going along with, with that, there are some meters that will calculate um, a percentage uh, noise exceeded levels. Um, that uh, goes with having some sort of internal memory that'll, that'll record uh, fast say fast time waiting over many different uh, segments of time, and then calculate statistics like L90 or L25. Some applications are going to require those numbers. There might be some other things like reverberation time that if your firm is going to measure that a lot, you can, it can be useful to have a meter that will do that analysis for you. If you have the time history, you can always do it after the fact, but sometimes it's useful to be able to calculate that in the field. Uh, one thing that's nice is a lot of times these metrics are um, kind of related to the, the firmware or the software in the sound level meter. So for some companies, you can purchase these after the fact. After you've bought the meter, you can go back and say, hey, actually, I do want to measure reverberation time. So make sure you ask about that when you're talking to vendors. One thing that I really like is meters that can do multiple channels, two, say two channels of measurements at the same time. One thing that I do frequently is use a, um, a microphone and an accelerometer at the same time. So the microphone is set up just to measure the ambient noise in the room. You take the accelerometer, put it on different potential sources of noise and say, 
is this the thing that's driving the noise in this room nope is this the thing driving the source of noise in this room um you can even get more fancy if you're kind of comfortable with with signal processing so what we did here was the the technician held a an accelerometer at different points on the outside of this boiler we can do some um some signal processing after the fact and we figured out that with just one accelerometer and one microphone that there's a breathing mode of this boiler that's driving the noise um, in the facility another thing you can do if you have access to multiple channels is do a, a two microphone sound intensity measurement and that's that can be very useful again for identifying the source of noise other things you might want to look for a little bit more application specific um, water resistance is certainly something that comes up a lot if you're doing environmental noise measurements um, just just pay attention to whether or not the microphone is included as the thing that is water resistant it's usually not so you'll want to get a, um, a, a weather resistant windscreen for the microphone along with whatever um, IP protection is on the sound level meter itself um, it can be useful to have um, particularly if you're working in in like legal settings if, if things are going to end up in court being able to track calibration over time and have a really clear record of when the sound level meter was calibrated and and what um, what calibrator was used and kind of traceable back to um, to SI or, or NIST or something that can be really useful again um, that's a little bit application specific not everyone needs that let me talk really briefly about things that are not sound level meters that that maybe you could use in their place maybe not um, this IEC standard defines uh, assembled meters so think of this as I have a, a general purpose data acquisition system maybe an oscilloscope or, or that has some some extra features on it and a microphone and I've, I've built my own sound level meter um, there are kind of two aspects of this one is whether or not you can achieve the accuracy that's required by the standard um, and that um, if you have the right equipment you you might be able to prove that that's accurate enough but also there's a bunch of other requirements of the IEC standard um, things like you know, electromagnetic isolation and and um, whether or not there's um, there's an instruction manual there's a lot of very specific stand um, items in the standard that you need to meet um, if you don't care about following the like the letter of the law of the standard then it's fine use whatever uh, whatever thing you want to make the measurement but if you're going to end up in a legal setting saying yeah I'm proving that my client is meeting um, meeting um, these noise regulations you're going to want a sound level meter that is a standalone thing that actually meets the standard and has been proven to meet the standard so you have to think about that as well when you're considering a sound level meter app like uh, there's a lot of smartphone based uh, sound level meter apps um, most of them are not necessarily guaranteed to work at all there's one that's worth taking a look at and that's the the, the NIOSH sound level meter iOS app just on on Apple devices um, I'll just show you what it looks like here uh, this actually has a lot of useful features like it can measure the equivalent um, a weighted equivalent level and a simultaneous measurement of the C weighted peak level and even noise dose um, very useful here <clears throat> um, but again it doesn't necessarily um, meet all of the requirements of the IEC standard so this can be useful just to like carry around with you and um, have with you for making a quick measurement but when you need to prove that your sound levels are what you say they are uh, an app-based um, uh, uh, sound level meter is not always the way to go so let me close here by talking just a, just a little bit about about personal preference um, when you and and you know kind of generally what to look for so it's always good if you can to um, talk to the vendors get your hands on these sound level meters whatever feels comfortable that you understand the interface is always going to be um, the best thing for you um, <clears throat> but 
when you're talking about what do I get for more money if I spend more, basically, if you only need to prove that you're in compliance with regulations, for example, if you only ever measure the noise from fire alarms according to the fire alarm noise standard and it has very specific metrics on what to use, then you can probably get by with a less expensive meter. On the other hand, if you're not always kind of doing the same measurement day to day and you frequently need to say, oh, what's making that noise, identifying the noise sources, having these features like one third octave band analysis and time history recordings can be hugely beneficial. So um, that's all I have. Thanks for watching this video. I look forward to your questions and comments and I'll see you at the conference. Okay, thank you, Tyler, for that great presentation on uh, uh, in our sound level tutorial session. Um, we've got a couple of questions coming in already. So the first one is from Brian, and he says, um, IEC 61672-1 specifies the frequency response acceptance limits in third octave resolution from 10 hertz to 20 kilohertz for both class one and class two meters. So he wonders why you listed a reduced frequency range for class two meters. Yeah. So that's a that's a good a good question, Brian. And and I'll just say right off the bat, like lots of this is oversimplified. <laughs> um, the I I just pulled up the standard wallet because I saw your question in the in the chat. Um, the the lower limit, so the the lower limit on class two is negative infinity dB. So like it it could output nothing at say sixteen hertz. Uh, which is why I sort of oversimplified that in the in the graph a little bit, and also at, at 10 kilohertz, it, it's like plus five to negative infinity is the is the bounds for the class two um, meters. Excellent. And another qu question from Brian: um, Are you aware of any standards related to um, level statistics, the LN values? Uh, it seems those are not well standardized. I'm off the top of my head. I don't. I don't know, but there there must be something on them. I don't know if, if maybe that's one we could bring back up in the we, yeah we maybe we'll circle afterwards. back to that. Yeah, and uh, one final question: Have you used class one or class two microphones that plug directly into an iPhone or iPad? If so, do you find them to be accurate? So it's it's important to note here that the <clears throat> that the class designations are for the system as a whole. So it's it's like the microphone, the the sound level meter includes the microphone, um, but you know in principle there's been some papers you can look at at um, there's some some JAZA papers that show oh, I'm comparing the output of my uh, of a sound level um, app to to um, like a class one sound level meter and and frequently they're they're accurate. Um, but under kind of narrow circumstances, the the write up for the NIOSH app is actually quite interesting because they uh, comment that on Android phones it's actually really hard to 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 get down to the down to the metal of what what the um, processor is doing, and that's uh, maybe not so easy, um, which is why it's an iOS only app. Great. Well, we do have another question, but I think we'll save that. It's a question on um, using apps. So I think we'll save that for our, our wrap-up session. And um, Tyler, I'll turn it back over to you to introduce the next paper.